ahead and we're going to get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to AI Arthritis Voices 360. This is the official talk show for the International Foundation for Autoimmune and Autoinflammatory Arthritis, or AI Arthritis for short. My name is Tiffany Westrich Robertson, and I am the CEO of the organization and also a person living with these diseases. Uh, many diagnoses, uh, as the, one of the attendees here can tell you a little bit more about, because that would be my rheumatologist, Dr. Kim. Say hello, Dr. Kim. Hi, how are you doing, Tiffany? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Why don't you, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah, so my name's Al Kim. I'm a rheumatologist, uh, an assistant professor of medicine at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri in the U.S. I also founded and co-direct the Lupus Clinic here at Washington University. Wonderful. And Suze? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, this is Suze Schrant. And like Tiffany, I have very sort of personal reasons for being here. I also have a form of arthritis. I have um, polyarticular JIA that now kind of behaves a lot like adult onset RA. I was diagnosed as a tweenager. Um, I've had lots of joint replacements and all kinds of, you know, medical uh, Olympics in my lifetime. Um, and then professionally, I work in uh, patient engagement. I've held roles at PCORI and at the Arthritis Foundation. And I recently launched um, my own little patient engagement shop called Expect um, with two P's and the two P's stand for patient partnership um, because patient partnership should be the expectation and not the exception. And I'm really um, most passionate about um, patient engagement and clinical training, um, pre and postgraduate clinical training, having, having patient service faculty members but I think patient engagement belongs everywhere. So I've worked in just about every, every nook and cranny of healthcare. And I also um, serve as a senior patient engagement advisor to SIDM, the Society to Improve Diagnosis and Medicine, um, because diagnosis is such a huge challenge, not just in our diseases, but across all diseases. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm not 100% sure we may have been cut off at the beginning. Um, hard to say. So <laughs> if, if we were, we are tuning in from AI Arthritis Voices 360, um, the talk show of the International Foundation for AI Arthritis. And uh, we are taking it live. This is the first time we have ever been live on one of our talk shows. Uh, we did an introduction a little while ago um, to what is called the Autoball. So you may be saying, why are these people <laughs> sitting with backdrops and, and racing attire? Uh, well, let me tell you, uh, the, our organization decided in 2020 that we were uh, growing so much and there was so many great resources that we had for so many people, the 450 million or so living around the world with AI arthritis diseases that we wanted to reach more. We wanted not only to reach more people so that we could help them, we wanted to reach more uh, of the community, hospitals, doctors, companies, just so people know that we're here. We, we've primarily been online since we started um, in 2011. And then COVID happened and we're back online. So <laughs> this, was, this was supposed to be an auto ball in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and now here we are. So we're still keeping the auto theme uh, for this event and what how this will work is we have different co-hosts for our talk show Suze is one of our recurring co-hosts so uh, you can always check all of our episodes at aiarthritis.org backslash podcast and we've got almost 50 of them already I can't believe it um, Dr. Kim is also recurring <laughs> So Dr. Kim helped us establish a pilot uh, series called Roomy Rounds, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, uh, but there are some great episodes to check out on that too that uh, bring the patients and the rheumatologists to the table as equals to have conversations uh, about uh, things that we find, feel would impact, better impact our care. So it's a, it's a different dynamic than the, than the patient doctor. We're, at, we're speaking as, as, uh, as equals. So I welcome you both and welcome all of you 
who are on Facebook right now. We are streaming live. So I see a lot of people. Hello, everyone, for, for joining in. We like to say at our show that we are at a table. We are all having seats at the table as equals. So whether that is a patient, a doctor, researchers, nurses, whomever that might be, if we need to solve the problems of today and tomorrow, we need to do it through conversation and problem solving. So our show is ingrained in our mission as an organization to help other people living with AI arthritis diseases have a voice alongside other stakeholders as equals to solve problems impacting education, advocacy, and research. We do that by throwing a topic on the table on one of our podcast shows, and then we circle it back to you and we ask you for your input. Then we visit it again at another future talk show episode, and then we keep going in that circle until we come up with a solution or resources for the community. So what's our topic today? Well, we are going to talk about a, a pillar issue at our organization, differentiating arthritis types. And uh, as, as an organization, we, we were founded by a couple different, with three different principles, really. One was the importance of differentiating arthritis types because we believe by doing so, we can improve awareness, education, outcomes for patients, we'll, which we'll get into a little bit more here soon. Also, making sure that the patient voice is always present and heard at the table. And then uh, the third part was that we could expedite early detection, referral, diagnosis, access to treatment, and then in turn, better quality of life, higher rates of remission, and less disability. So this is what we're going to call track one, differentiating arthritis types. And I'd like to start off um, if we all could share a little bit of why this topic is important to us. And we're going to ask you who are listening or watching, <laughs> forgot we're live now, watching us on our Facebook page, please feel free at any time to submit your comments, your stories as well while we're doing this. So Suze, why don't you start us off and tell us why this is really an important topic for you? Yeah, so it's funny. I think a lot of people get um, involved in an issue or become passionate about an issue because of what went wrong in their care. And in my case, I was diagnosed pretty promptly. It only took, I would say, a, a handful of weeks. Um, now, I had a really profound onset, so it was very clear something was very wrong. Every single joint was affected um, in a literally a number, a matter of weeks. So, um, it was a little bit, you know, kind of more straightforward. It was, it looked like a textbook case of, of poly JIA. Um, but I quickly learned after getting involved in patient advocacy that I was a unicorn <laughs> and everyone I met lingered, went doctor to doctor. Um, I had my only delay was um, my initial presentation was on my right knee. I actually had a Baker cyst that ruptured at cheerleading practice. And so that I saw an orthopedist who drained the fluid, shot it full of cortisone. And when I went back with both knees swollen, drained the fluid and shot them with cortisone, um, that was the only delay. And then the pediatrician intervened and, and sent me to a pediatric rheumatologist immediately. Um, the stories I hear now and have heard, I, I mark 30 years this summer that I've had this disease. So the stories I've collected and the people I've met um, really hammered home to me the, the difference that it makes. Um, even though when I was diagnosed, there were not great drugs available. I was on, you know, we all remember the cocktails of multiple therapies and um, none of it was great. Sometimes the cure was worse than the disease, but even though it wasn't great, I still fared much better than people who lingered without a, 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 you know, a diagnosis and got no care, no treatment. Um, so the, it's pretty market. If I stand next to someone and I know a lot of people like this who have my same diagnosis, maybe even diagnosed at the same age, you put us side by side or, or onset at the same age, but you put us side by side and the, the differentiating factor is always 
the, the promptness of our diagnosis. So it's, that's why I'm so, I feel like everyone should have my story and so few do, right? Right, right. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you know, for me, I, I was in my mid thirties when I had onset and I was, I was an athlete. I was kickboxing. I was playing softball on the company leagues. You know, I was playing volleyball on the beach. I lived in Los Angeles. I, I mean, I was in, I have a lot of energy generally as a person. So, you know, I was very high energy. I worked, I was a vice president at, a, at an architectural firm uh, doing business development and project management. I was a college teacher. I mean, I just felt like prime of my life, to be honest with you. And then all of a sudden I was teaching and I started noticing by the time my shifts were over on Friday, I was so exhausted. I couldn't stay awake later than like seven o'clock at night. And then I would sleep the whole weekend, start all over on Monday. And I thought, well, that's bizarre. So I guess my first, my first symptoms were really the fatigue that mm -hmm. come with the autoimmune and a low grade fever. And then I started getting pain in my chest, which ended up being costochondritis. Um, from there, I had pain, the same pain that was in my chest. I felt it in my foot. And then my middle finger, which I always say is very apropos <laughs> because it was my middle <laughs> <Great>. finger. Because <laughs> nobody knew what was wrong with me. And, um, and it, it just kept, it, it was such a mystery. No, everybody kept saying, or the primary care physicians would say, um, well, you clearly injured yourself. You kickbox, you play softball, you know, your volleyball, I, it's your, you know, you, you hurt yourself. That's, that's, that's what it is. So I would ask them, well, how do you explain then the fatigue and these weird low grade fevers that I keep getting? Like, I feel almost like I'm getting the flu or something. And, and I also felt like a shortness of breath and I just kept getting dismissed. It was treated separately, the arthritis versus the rest of it. And I really feel that that contributed to the delay in my personal diagnosis. Um, I finally did get a diagnosis after about two years, but at that time it had hit about 20 different locations in my body. and. I thought I had an infection because the side of my face was hurt so bad and I was sleeping about 16 hours a day and my fever wouldn't break. So I went to my primary care physician. He, he pressed on my jaw and I jumped at him and I grabbed him. <laughs> he didn't mean to, it just hurt so bad. And, uh, and after apologizing profusely, he said, well, that's your jaw joint. That's not an infection. And from there, I was sent to my second rheumatologist who, who eventually um, he diagnosed me originally with rheumatoid arthritis, but he did say this is atypical of rheumatoid arthritis because I did not have any kind of positive, infl like elevated inflammation, which we'll talk about in a little bit too. I know that's a big thing with Sue's. I didn't have the blood work. I didn't, you know, I didn't have. Also, it started on my left, and that was, and, and the joints in my fingers were by my fingernails, and that typically isn't consistent with rheumatoid arthritis, but. Back in 2007 to 2009, there was no such thing as non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. Oh, I should add, it also was in my tailbone area. So I was having trouble see sitting, and my friends thought that was really funny. So they bought me those little blow-up donuts, and they'd bring them to parties and tell me I could sit on them. So <laughs> they, would, was, they were trying to make me comfortable. Um, but he, we, they tested me for ankylosing spondylitis, but back then... There, there was no such thing as, as, as getting diagnosed with spondyloarthritis without the, the positive imaging. Um, and I did not have the gene, which is the HLA-E27 uh, gene. And at the time, it was also considered a man's disease. And I was not a man. So <laughs> they said I couldn't be ankylosing spondylitis. So the closest thing was rheumatoid arthritis. And I lived with that for a few years until eventually it was changed in 2013. But that's why, I mean, that, that is, that is um, two stories and that's just two, that's just two stories um, that, that have to do with why we believe so passionately. And I wanna add to that too, we'll circle back on this a little bit later, um, but another reason in addition to detection and diagnosis is a, is a severe misunderstanding 
around the word arthritis and that the fact that there are different types of arthritis. So there, and I, and I will ask Dr. Kim to, to go into that a little bit for us, uh, but are having to do with having an autoimmune disease or an autoinflammatory disease. And then you have the more commonly known osteoarthritis. Um, then there's others like gout, for example. Uh, but putting all of them in one lump, in one basket, if you will, can create confusion to people who know no different. So they hear the word arthritis and they just assume, oh yeah, I have that in my knee or my grandma had that and she was fine. And so it does us a little bit of a disservice. So we recommend differentiating and that's what we're pushing for here at the Auto Ball and with our mission. Um, so Dr. Kim, tell us your perspective. Why is this, uh, this issue important to you? And, and if you have any you know, stories of patients to share too, feel free to do that. Oh, absolutely. So there are two main reasons why the diagnosis and especially early diagnosis is critical. The first, it obviously dictates treatment. So you mentioned several different reasons for arthritis. Some of it could be autoimmune, autoinflammatory. We generally lump this as an inflammatory arthritis as a whole. And so to me, I actually don't care if it's autoimmune or autoinflammatory. I need to know if it's an inflammatory arthritis because that encompasses both. That's not a disease per se, that's a symptom, but that allows me to then say, okay, immunosuppression is most likely going to help. Key features of that is going to be stiffness in the morning in particular, and also improvement with activity. So this is paradoxical. If you break your arm, for example, the more you use it, the more it's going to hurt. The more you rest it, the better it is. Autoimmune, autoinflammatory, or just in general, inflammatory arthritis, the plural of arthritis, has an exact opposite presentation. So this is actually very confusing, and um, a lot of physicians misdiagnose this aspect because of the relative rarity of these conditions compared to other joint diseases. Of course, the other joint diseases, such as gout, are gonna be more common. That presents very classically, though, very sudden on onset, very quick, very painful. Osteoarthritis is probably the most common, but, that's the, but this is a degenerative arthritis, and the inflammation in terms of how we see it it is very mild, but it appears that the inflammation largely is within the bone itself as opposed to the joint. Mm -hmm. And so there are research topics looking at this particular issue and whether or not this is treatable. Finally, then you have joint pain that's not truly arthritis, but we'll call arthralgias. So this is joint space pain, but it's not, it's without any signs, overt signs of inflammation. Chronic pain syndrome is a classic example of this, right? So each of these are treated differently, and that's the first point. The second point is that the earlier the diagnosis, the better the outcomes in general. But on top of that is going to be the third point, is that each of these types of arthritis carry other symptoms with it that we need to keep be vigilant about. For example, chronic pain syndrome. To me, that's a sleep disorder until otherwise proven. Poor sleep for 5, 10, 15 years, then chronic pain. And, and then that's the, the, what they usually present. But in our society, we tend to kind of crap on the idea of good sleep. We actually brag about the fact that we sleep poorly, right? Sometimes to other people. So culturally, we actually can't pick up the sleep part very well. And most physicians don't pick up on this either. But we only pick it up once it starts manifesting with other symptoms. So chronic pain would be one with poor sleep. Gout with high uric acid levels. Um, and then you start moving into the auto, the inflammatory arthritis and, and degenerative arthritis and trying to differentiate those two. Again, the morning stiffness and getting better with activity really gets the inflammatory arthritis um, group separated from the degenerative arthritis group. But again, all of these, the earlier you pick it up, the faster you can treat, the easier you can treat it, the uh, better the overall outcomes. So those are going to be the main three things why it's important to not only differentiate, but also pick up the symptoms early. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, one of the one of the things that we will do, um, not during this this segment right here, but after the fact, is we are going to put up a poll on this page, uh, just to ask uh, how what how peop what people think about arthritis if they know the differences. So there's gonna so look later today uh, or tomorrow probably for some polls because we want to get your your input and your idea. And if you're listening out there um, or watching on Facebook, we certainly would like to hear your opinions and your stories uh, on why this topic is important to you. Uh, because we, together, by having all of our voices at the table is how we can, we can solve these problems. Um, 
I wanted to to jump in a little bit. Uh, Suze, I had I had said we were going to circle back uh, to if you have diagnosis and then also being misunderstood. I know you and I have talked a lot about um, being too young. You're too young to have arthritis. That's I know that's a bit that's a big one. You for see you. my hair light on fire when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Could, could you expand a little bit on that? Because that also adds to not only mis misinformation or misunderstanding of what this type of arthritis is, um, but you were, were a person that lived with this because you had yeah. juvenile onset. Yeah. So there's sort of two domains to this. There is um, still uh, a, a lack of great understanding um, in some parts of the, the medical community. So I won't say it's pervasive everywhere, but I have had my fair share of encounters, even with medical professionals who have said, oh, you're, you're too, that you must have misunderstood that that can't be what your diagnosis is. Um, but then there's sort of the public perception. And I, um, I feel like it, it's almost wrapped up in the same misunderstanding as the difference between OA and all these inflammatory um, arthritis. So people kind of, even if you say, no, 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 it's not OA. It's not what your grandma has. It's not going to get better just by exercise and diet. Even I know that'll help, but it's not going to get better. Um, I need these complicated treatments. Um, I think then when I say what it is, there's still just sort of this disbelief. Um, maybe it's a, maybe it's an issue of not wanting to believe that scary diseases can happen to young people. I, I, it's, you know, I'm not sure what the, what, why there's such a reticence, but I mean, I have pretty frightening stories from growing up um, we lived near Kansas City, so we we weren't super rural. But my my people, and we go many generations back to the middle of Kansas. I mean, the middle. <laughs> There's you know nothing there. And I had a, a during this one sort of three year period of time, I had several seizure episodes. We we never really did figure out what it was. I think it was a, a, a kind of a reaction between two medications. So I tried. Um, you know, w stopping some and, and we eventually got them to go away. But I had one of these seizure episodes in church in the middle of Kansas. And we went immediately to the nearest clinic, which was a, a very long drive. And even there, the, the clinician that I was working with was just stymied, had not, he was like, I, I don't, you're way too young to have that type of disease. I don't, I don't think that can be right. And so it, it just really is destabilizing um, to we you you are going somewhere to get help and to have someone um, either make you start questioning. Oh, gosh, maybe maybe we maybe we didn't understand the diagnosis or you're just terrified that, oh, my gosh, this is where I'm getting my medical care from. And he doesn't believe that I have this disease. Now, that is not the majority of cases. So I want to be very clear that most of the time uh, that's not a concern, but it has been a real, it has been a real challenge in my life. It's pretty fascinating. That's interesting that you just said that about, um, maybe I did because when they were telling me about injuring myself, I started to second guess myself and I would say, well, maybe right. I, yeah, it, cause you do, you start, you, because you don't have, you don't have, yeah. um, you don't have anything else uh, to go on that. I, I did want to ask you, Dr. Kim, um, you know, you're a rheumatologist, so you obviously know <laughs> that there is typically a young I a hope so. Onset. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, you know, there is typically a younger onset when it comes to an autoimmune disease or an autoinflammatory disease, not saying that you cannot get osteoarthritis at any age. Of course, you know, you, you can get osteoarthritis uh, younger as well. Um, but when you, when you first see a patient, um, what are the symptoms that you typically look for in addition to joint pain to start to differentiate, let's say, an osteoarthritis 
from an autoimmune disease or an autoinflammatory disease? So I think the two main things that I focus on is the location of the pain. Um, and this not only includes which joints, but also maybe outside of joints such as muscles. So chronic pain syndrome, for example, has pretty significant muscle pain on top of joint pain. That's unique. Most autoimmune muscle diseases are actually painless. It causes weakness, but no pain. So um, though, you know, those are, are relatively subtle, but this is, these are important. The location is very important, whether it's going to be in your lower back, your sacroiliac joints for some of these spondyloarthritis, or your small medium joints for rheumatoid arthritis, or even psoriatic arthritis with the skin issues. You know, so all of those can give us really important information. Uh, the other issue, like we mentioned before, is what makes it better, what makes it worse, when's the worst time, all right? So kind of the kinetics of the pain, um, you know, is it worse in the morning or is it worse after your activity, you know, at, at the end of the day? So that also helps differentiate it. So I think the thing that uh, Suze had brought up about kind of not being believed is actually interesting to us because um, the way we teach these diseases, uh, we teach them as archetypes, okay? And um, because we have to somehow cram all this information in a one hour lecture to right. people who are probably not going to see the diseases ever in their life. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, common things being common, a physician, when they see someone, even if they're young, they're going to say, OK, at the population level, if I were in Vegas and I had ten thousand dollars in chips or a Formula One behind me, let's say it's, you know, Monaco. All right. All right. I had 10,000 euros of chips. All right. And, you know, I'm playing the joint pain game in terms of what the diagnosis is. And let's say, you know, one out of three people with joint pain has osteoarthritis, whereas one in a hundred people have an inflammatory arthritis. Mm -hmm. Where would you put your chips to double up? Mm -hmm. Answer is easy. So common things are common. So oftentimes the other symptoms that are associated for a patient can be ignored largely because of lack of familiarity, right? And also that uh, they're not, you know, part of the, you know, it's mostly lack of familiarity. Like I said, a lot of these, a lot of physicians don't ever see these autoimmune diseases, autoinflammatory diseases in their life, right? When they treat them, all right? So the, the uncommonness is a real issue uh, when it comes to um, getting an early diagnosis. I, I was going to actually ask about the, the education of, of the patients, and that actually leads me uh, to the next part of this that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, now, Suze, I, how long did it take you to get to a rheumatologist? I, again, I just hit the jackpot. I mean, we know the shortage of pediatric rheumatologists in particular, rheumatologists in general, but pediatric in particular, I mean, the shortage is dire. And I just happened to live near Kansas City where there were not one, but two pediatric rheumatology centers, one on the Missouri side and one on the Kansas side. So I got into my rheumatologist. I mean, and I will say again, just because I, I don't want to sort of misrepresent that this is a typical case. I looked, it looked like it could have been lupus, systemic JIA or poly JIA. I mean, I was sick. I had lost pound after pound. I couldn't stay awake. I was symptomatic in every joint. I had a rash. I had a cyclical fever. So they were, you know, we're trying to figure out, is this cancer or sepsis or what is happening to me? So I feel like when the pediatrician called the pediatric rheumatologist, I feel like they, you know, sort of bartered for, we've got to get her in. So it, I don't quite remember. I actually have a lot of, um, you know, in bad eighties movies where there's like the dream sequence, that's what this whole period of time looks like in my memory. Cause I was so ill. Um, I want to say it was less than a week. I mean, I think we got in right away. Wow. Um, and it was good because, I mean, I was having systemic effects. My, even as mad as I get about blood markers and people being told they're fine because there's no blood markers, I had, everything was positive and off the charts. My CRP was crazy. I did have a 
a abnormal ANA titer, but over time we were able to rule out these other diseases. So um, all of that is to say, again, I was very lucky that it happened that way because I got right in. But a lot of the education work I do for in the primary care space, I do a CME for primary care clinicians. Um, you know, we're, we're always focused on if you suspect an inflammatory type of arthritis, you've got to refer ASAP. But you, but then the problem is refer where, I mean, do you, is there a rheumatologist that can take you? Um, and that's a scary reality in our country. So I was very lucky. Wow. Yeah. Um, Dr. Kim, how, when you first, when, when you first get your, your patient in, like if it's the, you're their first rheumatologist, let's say it wasn't you know, like me, <laughs> for those just tuning in, Dr. Kim is also my rheumatologist. So um, I'm very lucky to, to, to have found him. Um, but when it's somebody new coming in, how often would you say um, they come in and have had quite an extensive journey to get to your office? I mean, yeah, for well, first our, of all, uh, yeah. you're a long wait to get in to see. <laughs> so yeah, long. I know. If you want to see so, Dr. Kim, you're waiting a few months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so just to address that part is that, you know, so actually it's interesting is that my job description here at WashU isn't based off my clinical interests. It's based off of my research um, mm. uh, capabilities. So actually seeing patients doesn't help me in terms of promotion. Right. So I think when you go to academic places where you know pediatric rheumatologists, you know, and that's where most of them are going to be. I think this is something that has to be considered within the overall equation that most people don't understand is that if they're especially research based, um, we are being we were hired by the university for the research, the clinical stuff. They'll say as long as it doesn't interfere with your research, that's fine. All right. So you may shake your head about that. But these, this, these are the terms. These terms have been established for decades. All right. And so this is just something that I think people don't fully understand about the academic world. Now, in the private practice role. Yeah. So, so that's part, you know, they they have a much um, they're, they're looking for throughput. So that's part of the reason why my wait is so long is I only see patients a half day a week. So that's just the way it is, because I have to protect my research time. All right. Because patient time does take a lot of time out of my week. So having said that, um, I think one of the things about um, you know, so you mentioned about like blood work, Susan, and I think this is a fascinating thing about the archetype, right? That we, the way we teach and the way we test requires certain things to be positive. The reality is, is that the blood work is actually can be irrelevant, right? And to me, and I would say most sophisticated rheumatologists, right? It's, <laughs> it's secondary, right? The blood work is absolutely secondary because there's nothing that's what we, you know, that's going to be specific for disease. Um, like, you know, a good example would be that rheumatology is very similar to psychiatry in the sense there's no blood work, there's no blood test for bipolar disease or schizophrenia or anxiety or depression, right? Uh, there could be other reasons that drive it, which some imaging or blood work could help point towards. But in general, you can't, it's a clinical diagnosis, very similar with arthritis. It's a clinical diagnosis. It's impossible for me I, I refuse to see what the blood work is before I see a patient the first time. All right. I refuse. I don't really? want my, yeah, I don't want my mind to be biased. <laughs> right. I want to know what the story is from the patient because, you know, what we teach in med school is, you know, you know, how does a test change your, the probability of disease before the test is done and after the test is done. Something called pre-test probability and post-test probability. Not that I calculate that. Right. But for example, if there's someone who I suspect has lupus based off of symptoms and I check an ANA and it's high titer, that's OK. You know, that's consistent. Right. It, it keeps things and, you know, uh, the, lupus, the lupus diagnosis high. But if my suspicion of lupus is low, yet they have a really high titer ANA, then, you know, one percent times, you know, a tenfold increase in likelihood still leaves you with 10 percent likelihood. Nine out of 10 times, that means that they still don't have disease, right? It's a, it's a very simple numbers game. Um, but again, we teach archetypes. So if you're positive ANA, think lupus. When I think of positive ANA, I think they're alive. That's basically it, right? 
again, it's it, nine out of 10 people with a positive ANA don't have an autoimmune disease, nine out of 10, all right? Which means if you have a positive ANA and you have an autoimmune disease, you're actually unlucky, right? You're actually unlucky, right? So again, if you're going to be in Vegas or Monaco and you're playing the ANA lupus game and you're saying, oh, you know, someone has a positive ANA and you have two places to double up your chips, healthy or lupus, where do you put your chips? In a mm -hmm. heartbeat healthy, in a heartbeat. You're unlucky <laughs> to have yeah. lupus, right? So again, this is just, that's kind of, I think, the, the more sophisticated way of how we look at these labs and the relationship to symptoms, right? Symptoms by far and away. But again, medicine right now has gotten so good in other disciplines where the labs, the radiology tests can be specific for a disease. And so we have that same expectation for autoimmune diseases, autoinflammatory diseases. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. I want to ask a question because you were talking about ANA. It, it, the same is true, correct, with uh, the rheumatoid factor? Because yeah. It's, have, yeah. I wanted it's, to touch. I mean, yeah, we, know, just, we know that, but I wanted to, if for people yeah, who don't, who are listening. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, to me, that's a cool story, bro, type of thing until I can link it up with some symptoms that make me think, okay, there's actually a relevance to the positive room for factor. I, I hope it's okay if I jump in, Tiffany. Yeah. I just have to, I, I was not clapping to be sort of silly. I, this is music to my ears. Yeah, me too. I, I, and <laughs> Tiffany, I don't know if you have this same issue. I am sort of known as the grim reaper to my friends and family because I will no doubt get, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend referred to me who has classic RA presentation. They are swollen. They are painful. It's not viral. I, and I am, and I, you know, go to the rheumatologist, they go get worked up and they report back. My, my blood work was negative and I have to be the person that says that does not matter. It is a clinical diagnosis. And so people like they're, oh, don't ask Sue. She's going to tell you, you have something bad, but it's, this happens all the time. And the ACR guidelines are so clear. I mean, not, that is not a requirement. You need one swollen joint for six weeks or longer that can't be otherwise attributed. I'm not, I'm butchering it, but something that simple. Um, so I just, what do you think well, you've already talked about it's the way we, we teach it in medical school, but what can we do to change that locked in mindset? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think you also bring up the interesting in issue about these criteria. So there's actually the criteria that we have for many of our diseases actually are not diagnostic criteria. They're I classification criteria, right? So what's the difference? Classification criteria means that if you have 100 people diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and 100 people that you know that don't have rheumatoid arthritis, and then you apply the criteria on them, how well do they perform, all right? These criteria are generated mostly, in, you know, how would they are applied in the real world is for inclusion or exclusion from research studies, that the fact that we are making sure that a rheumatoid arthritis patient is being studied as opposed to uh, some other arthritis patient, okay. all right, that looks like rheumatoid arthritis. Would, that's different than diagnostic criteria. We have, say, 100 people that you don't know what's going on, and then you apply the criteria. So all of our stuff is classification criteria. In other words, we've already made the diagnosis. Now we're going to classify them post-diagnosis. Do they classify for rheumatoid arthritis or not? Using them as diagnostic criteria per se is a can of worm. I, I don't know how they perform. No one's ever done those type of studies, right? because it probably won't work, right? I would guess it would never work, right? It, there's, it's just too nonspecific. Wow. So um, or, or to the point where we can come out and say, okay, you know, we're 99% sure. We might be able to say, yeah, we're about two thirds sure, which still means it's one third unsure, all right? So again, these, these levels, again, so I think the biggest problem is that, it, and this is true for everyone, it's, you know, and this is clinicians too, where we make assumptions about how things are, and most of our assumptions are wrong, and when our assumptions are wrong, though, but yet we treat them as facts, this is what happens. We get into these specific situations. So um, 
I think the most important thing to address the question more directly is, again, it's going to be have to be awareness. And we almost have to somehow develop some sort of algorithm that allows, uh, especially primary care physicians, to rapidly assess and differentiate the types of arthritis. They're not going to nail the diagnosis, but at least it points them in the right direction. You know, a uh, you know, obvious example would be, say, osteoarthritis, the knee, and to the point where, you know, they're debilitated. Um, you know, then you know, they wouldn't have to go to a rheumatologist. Maybe they go to an orthopedic surgeon with a physical therapist type of thing. Or, you know, so again, it's kind of like trying to figure out how do you, you know, streamline um, within, say, you know, electronic medical records to say, okay, there are key symptoms you wrote down. And then it will default to saying, okay, th this is the next question to follow up. You almost don't need a doctor at that point, right? Because the entire process at the early stage is going to be automated. I mean, that's one way of thinking about it. I know there's a lot of colleagues that would say, Al, that's not how we should be doing things. I don't know what the right answer is. If I were going to treat this as a computer game like The Sims and say, this is how we're going to do it, that's how I would do it. I would actually have that front line the first evaluation be very algorithmic. It's going to miss diagnoses. There's absolutely no doubt. But the most important thing is not the diagnosis, but getting them to the right person who can make the diagnosis. Right. So. Right. Um, I have a follow-up question to that. So if you, if you were going, let's say we were going to make a list. <laughs> what what would the what what would fall? What would be some of the key symptoms for that evaluation? that of doc, if it was going to be passed on, or, you know, because we've talked about this, Dr. Kim, you and I have talked about this on another episode on one of the roomy rounds about how when I ended up to you, my record was just a mess <laughs> from just that was a that was a sad that was a sad day when that landed on my desk. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to apologize. I saw that file and I was like, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you get, but, but that's a, that's one of the reasons. So if we could, because we, one of the things we want to take out of this episode, because the purpose of this is to have all voices at the table so that we can start to solve some of these problems. If we were going to start to create some type of list of, um, you know, we talked about the off the arthritis specific that, that could fall under to differentiate that. What about the other key symptoms? What are some things that would be on that list? to help, uh, to help, whether it's a, a rheumatologist, I guess a rheumatologist, let's start there, rheumatologist, what would okay. fall in that list? So to me, the first one would be location of the pain. Uh, the second would be the quality of pain and, and kind of how it presents, you know, the, the morning stiffness aspects. The most complicated feature though about rheumatology is there are a lot of overlapping joint pain issues, right? In a single joint, you could have pain from rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis and chronic pain syndrome. Mm -hmm. Which one is driving the, the, phena, the, the presentation at that moment? And how do you differentiate between those, right? I think from a prime care uh, physician, physician perspective, that's really hard because it's even hard for us. But if we we're going to make that list, I would want to know how does the pain present and whether or not the patient, and so a lot of this is what is now educating the patient. So oftentimes the first time I diagnose someone I, or see someone, I don't, I don't have a clue what their diagnosis is because much of the time they, they have, a lot of our patients haven't really thought at a granular level about the types of pain they experience in the joint, right? Because it could be a combination of things, mm. right? And again, this is what makes it harder to diagnose. It, and this is also the reason why a lot of symptoms um, are felt, are ignored by physicians and healthcare providers is because, you know, if I'm trying to say, I'm trying to figure out room to arthritis, yet you're giving me a chronic pain picture. I'm like, okay, I already know you have chronic pain, but I'm trying to figure out now if you have something else on top of that. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to table all that chronic pain, despite the fact that it's 99% of your uh, re reduction in your quality of life, right? And this is hard. So anyway, I don't think there's a clear algorithm from that perspective, but at the same time, I do think that we have to then take several visits or several phone calls to help the patient figure out, are there different types of pain that they're experiencing that maybe a room to arthritis, which is mostly say the knuckles of the hands versus the pain in the side of their hip, which is actually not your hip. That's actually your 
trochanteric process, part of your femur, femur bone, but this can cause what we colloquially call trochanteric bursitis, you know, and maybe that's, you know, pops up when you have a chronic pain fl uh, flare, but not a rheumatoid arthritis flare, right? Mm -hmm. Can we tell the, can we educate the patient to be able to figure out how the core, what the correlations are? Right? right, so that's the level of granularity we're looking at, mm -hmm. but that's really hard to educate because a lot of physicians don't even realize to think about this. So, you know, so what we end up doing is that, well, you know, trying to do that is really hard at the population level, right? So it ends up having that we have to spend time getting to know each patient to figure out if they can, we can help each other differentiate the different types of pain within a single joint. Right. That makes right. Sense. So again, yeah. So in terms of an algorithm, yeah, I think the first thing, okay, location, location, location to me is a really important variable. The second is, can I differentiate an inflammatory arthritis component to this? Can I uh, differentiate a wear and tear degenerative component out of this? Is there actually something more like a virus, right? Like chikungunya, which presents exactly like rheumatoid arthritis. You can't differentiate the two clinically. You know, uh, SARS-CoV-2, right? The virus that causes uh, COVID-19. We're starting to see increasing reports of inflammatory arthritis after viral infections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is it that too, right? Or is it a chronic pain, right? So each of these are going to present differently um, as an archetype and may also present somewhat differently between people, right? Because again, a lot of this now is also how you perceive pain. Right. So right. Th th you can see how complicated it is when you try to do all this. We need better blood work, bottom line. All right. Um, we, if we try to objectify subjective things, you know, you lose uh, that in, in that translation, you lose signal. You know, right? There's a lot more noise. So the blood work, though, is helpful. But until then, my main thing is when I first see a patient is to really understand what, okay, so what's bothering the most is what I'm thinking, what they're thinking, the real reason, all right? And oftentimes they're not the same diagnosis, right? The patient may be thinking one thing, I'm thinking of another thing, why? Why are we discordant? Is it because I'm wrong? Or is it that because their perception of what's going on um, is also confounded by other things that are going on, right? That they have multiple things, you know, that's occurring within their joints. Most of the time, it's just a one thing, one thing that's affecting them, but sometimes we do run into these situations where it is much more complicated. So again, I just need to know from a patient's perspective whether or not we can train them to get them to think about the different types of pain that they have. And when they have pain quality A versus B versus C, what else is going on at the same time that we can put into the A bucket, into the B bucket, into the C bucket, right? And then that gives me an idea to say, okay, they have, the B bucket is not very compelling. You know, it could be gout, whatever. But, you know, the osteoarthritis and the RA picture is very striking. Um, and so, but obviously they're gonna be treated very differently. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, so that, you know, so that's kind of how I, I approach it. Okay. I know, Suze, you had, did you have a question? Well, I just wanted to, and I don't know if there's an answer for this or not, but I wondered, uh, Dr. Kim, is there anything promising in use now or in the pipeline um, around imaging? Like, could we do sonography, ultrasound, something to see inflammation in a joint to help with diagnosis? Especially, I've met a lot of people, and I don't know if you have, Tiffany, who have a diagnosis or, or, or trying to get a diagnosis, and they don't have a lot of really visible swelling. They might have warmth. Me. Is that you? Okay. It's now I do. Okay. But I'm, but I am, you know, 12, 13 years, you know, I'm right in now, but in right. the beginning I had no swelling. I had no heated. And I mean, Dr. Kim, you should be really happy. You didn't, you, you didn't have me back then. I was, I mean, I was tough. I, I, nobody could figure it out. I looked, I mean, well, we all get the, you look, you know, you look you normal. Look, that kind yeah. Of you look good. Yeah. Because you're a cup of tea now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Good one. <laughs> oh, so go ahead, go ahead, Suze. So you gonna have some, did you have something else? Yeah, so that's that? it. I just didn't know, Dr. Kim, if there is anything like that. 
Yeah, the answer is yes. The problem is what the denominator. Okay, so for example, ultrasound, all right? Um, we can pick an MRI, which is even way more sensitive, I think. We can pick up a lot of things in it. Are they clinically actionable, i.e. are they important? Or are they just findings, all right? So again, the... The fact assumption, you know, I've already brought this up, how we treat our assumptions like facts and they're usually wrong. You know, the fact is, is that, okay, in the ultrasound, we see enhanced um, Doppler image of you know, blood flow and swelling within the joint. That's the fact. That's the limitation of that fact too. Does that mean it's rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory arthritis or something else? I don't know. I don't know, yeah. All right? We don't know. So the real work then is saying okay is that piece of fact then actionable is it in, you know how do we best interpret it that gives us gets us closer to the truth to being correct um and that's the challenging aspect i think with these newer technologies is that uh, yes we are becoming more we are picking up inflammation within the joint you know much earlier and much quicker and certainly for a fraction of the people this is going to lead to earlier diagnosis absolutely no doubt but what's the number needed to treat or number needed to image in order to achieve earlier diagnosis in 10 people, right? Is it 15 people that we, you know, in other words, two thirds, one third of the people have findings were started in treatment, but unfortunately there wasn't the right diagnosis. And as a result, um, we inflicted harm with no benefit, mm. right? So I think that, um, you know, this is something that we're very, I'm very vigilant about. Um, I know there are people who are very gung-ho about ultrasound. Um, I don't use it that often, mostly because I see lupus. And so it, it doesn't have as much utility in lupus as it does for the um, inflammatory arthritis as a whole. Um, but, you know, same thing. Like, for example, I have unilateral sac sacroiliitis on my right side. But that's mostly because of sports. It's not because I have ankylosing spondylitis or some sort of spondyloarthropathy, it's spond spondyloarthritis, right? It's because, you know, so again, there is inflammation there. there. It's a sacroiliitis. That's part of the definition of the spondyloarthritis, you know, for a chunk of them, right? But again, that's where the fact stops. Now, what's the official, di what is the diagnosis? That's the interpretation. And so this is the challenge with the imaging. All right. And same thing with blood tests. I think blood tests are going to run to the same problem is that we don't know the true denominator of the number of people that have positive findings. And what is the numerator that then say, okay, this is rheumatoid arthritis. This is disease X, Y, Z, right? So this is the, that takes time. That almost takes, a, that almost requires a real world experience outside of a clinical study or construct in order to really get an idea of what's going on. So that unfortunately takes time though. Thank you. Sorry though, yeah, burst bubbles from the audience. They're like, oh my gosh, there's new imaging. Oh no, it's not gonna work. You know, we see the same thing with COVID testing right now, right? Especially the serology the antibody testing. That's a good example, all right? That um, the theory of it is, is, is perfect. I mean, we leverage it for many other diseases, you know, uh, infectious diseases, you know, the presence of antibodies and it works. The problem that we're seeing with COVID testing is that the test itself is low, lower quality than we had anticipated. On top of that, there's so many different types of serology tests from so many different companies that perform all differently, mm -hmm. right? So again, this is where, are we assuming that if we the, if the test is out there, it's gonna work? No, we should never assume that, right? And that's kind of the same thing with the imaging and blood work when we look into the future is that, my skepticism as a researcher is going to say, it's not going to work. That's my baseline, right? right? Prove it to me, you know, you know, you know, that, that, you know, where I can say, you know what, I actually believe in what you guys are putting out, for, you know, putting mm -hmm. forth, all right? Whereas, you know, many of the patients are saying, oh my gosh, there's a new test. We've got to do it. You know, something, this is what we call in research rigor, all right? In other words, we're saying, okay, you know, where do we, um, how much, how much doubt do we put into a set of findings that then causes us to then interpret the information the way an au the authors of the research group interpret it or how a patient interprets it? And this causes a lot of friction between patients and, and me, per certainly, 
all right, where they're coming in with a positive ANA, they're told they have lupus from a chronic care physician or ER physician, and I tell them that I don't think they have lupus. Well, they've already done research, they've already done work, they're already convinced of it, all right? And so um, that that's really challenging. Uh, but again, that's kind of where uh, maybe from our own end uh, within the healthcare profession is reiterating over and over again what the right message that should be given to the patient if a particular blood value is positive, right? That way expectations are set, that the conversation moves forward without um, immediate feelings of discordance and, you know, feeling ignored or, you know, not being validated type of thing. Because if, if, you, if that is the first thing that happens in the visit, you're screwed, everyone's screwed. Right. You know, you gotta start all over with someone else. That's really hard to repair right off the bat. Yeah, that definitely, I, I made a little note. I think that we have to do a breakout episode on roomy rounds on, on, on that a little bit more. I know we talked about it in one of the roomy rounds episodes as well, but this whole, there's a lot of layers of communication um, that, that need to happen that maybe aren't happening and how can we uh, help patients and, and doctors br bridge that. Um, but I, I want to circle back really quick too, because Dr. Kim, I had asked you, and and for those just just joining us, we've got we've got several people that have been coming on um, on the feed. I was I was looking at, so thank you for for joining us. And the topic being the importance to differentiate arthritis types, kind of the type of arthritis that is associated with our diseases, autoimmune or autoinflammatory. Um, and I had asked Dr. Kim if uh, if we had a kind of a bullet list what would be on, on those domains, let's say. And we were talking about pain and variations of pain in addition to um, some of the differentiating arth arthritic facts we were talking about. I wanna ask the same question to Suze. If you were gonna create a list and based on what, what's important for what, you th what you're thinking as a patient, this is most prominent for me, or these are the things that I think a doctor should look for, what would you add to that? But you can only add like a few things. It can't be like 25. 15, right. <laughs> Honestly, what you're making me think is more, so I'm being such a lawyer and <laughs> I'm circling around the question. Um, I think the what we would have to do is crowdsource, and I'm sure you've already, you probably already have a perfect vision for this, crowdsource from a lot of patients and figure out even things like word choices. Like we've all, we're all probably familiar with um, like the commercials around meningitis and how they say people describe it as the worst headache they've ever had. And that's, they came to that language because so many patients describe it that way. What if we could do like a, a natural history across the patient community and figure out what those words are do you know what I mean? Like there's, because I think there are language triggers that we just haven't nailed down yet. And those could be really important. So if it's someone coming in saying, oh, I just, you know, whatever I heard all over. Um, but, it, but it's not the kind of pain that you or I would describe. Whereas we might say something like, you know, um, all of a sudden I can't, like pick up my seven pound cat, or I'm noticing I can't because of pain, tie my shoes. Like there, I'm, I'm butchering this, but I think you know what I mean. I think there's probably language or cadence or something that we could figure out if we crowdsourced from a couple hundred patients and those trigger words or, or descriptions could be part of this list. So you're like looking for five key buzzwords does, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. One yeah, of the I things, think, oh, go ahead, Dr. Kim. No, I think this is fascinating because we were think we've thought about this from a lupus perspective. One of the things we're running into issues for, with, uh, first, uh, American language is very hyperbolic. Mm. I, I just used it. I said very <laughs> hyperbolic. That's redundant, <laughs> right? But this is the best thing ever. This is the worst thing ever. All right. And that actually reflects in terms of how people manifest their symptoms. Either people are minimizers or it's, it's you know, scale out of yeah. one out of 10, you know, I'm a 15. But if 10 means that I threw a hundred knives at you and they all landed in your body, you're actually worse than that. And they say, yes. Okay. 
So there's one aspect there where uh, an appreciation for the gradation of our adjectives and adverbs lost, right? That's cultural. But the second is going to be within ethnic groups too. How each ethnic group manifests this is going to be different. How European Americans versus African Americans versus Asian Americans versus Hispanic Americans. A lot of this is based off of cultural influences on health, right? So I, I don't, I'm, this is well beyond my scope of research expertise or anything that I know anything about, but I'm still gonna say something, <laughs> is that I do think that maybe the best way to do this may have to be ethnic specific and may even need, need to be regionally specific. Mm -hmm. That his, say Hispanic Americans in Southern California may manifest differently than Hispanic Americans in Florida, all right? And so again, where, how much data do we need to get before it's even useful? All right. Uh, and so I think that's kind of, that's the challenge that we see from our end um, with, with that. Uh, I know there are people that are looking at this, um, but I, I, yeah, that's kind of well beyond my other, my scope of knowledge though. I, I do have one other, uh, an actual list item, Tiffany, to, yes. to, to actually answer the question. Um, and that is, and again, I don't know if this is universal, but it's universal across almost every patient I know with this disease. Um, not for a clinician, not to assume that it must not be that bad if I'm still able to go to work, get dressed and come to my appointment or whatever it is, because I think pretty universally, at least in the community I'm familiar with, we get, we get through it. It is not pretty and it is not fun, but we get through it. And I would hate to think that there's any sort of processing going on that would lead someone to, to think, well, it must not be RA or spondyloarthropathy because she's still going to work. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That, that to me is a big flag, a big concern. Yeah, that, that's important to point out. So thank you, thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, yeah, I actually ran into that problem early in my training because when I saw medicine, general medicine patients, you know, we saw everything to death, right? And the impact on families and stuff like that. And so the dynamic range of suffering was big. And then when I went to rheumatology, you know, RA, you know, is increases the risk of heart attack and stroke. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But a lot of it, it's a, it's a chronic disease. And so the dynamic range of suffering is a little bit squashed, but for that patient, it's always one to hundred until 101 is hit, 102 is hit, right? And so it's that dynamic range. So in other words, I'm desensitized. I was desensitized to that because of my, my training, mm -hmm. right? When you see a, lung, a metastatic lung cancer patient, for example, right? That's a different level of suffering too, all right? But again, I was desensitized. Now, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just seeing that this is a common experience amongst, amongst my peers. Okay, I am going to, I'm, I'm looking at the time here. I'm going to add something uh, to the list. So the, Going back to the, the topic here of, of how to differentiate arthritis, and, and um, one of the things is with expediting detection, and we do have, we, you know, there's also the issue of being misunderstood by, by peers and family, et cetera. I'm staying on the early diagnosis for a second. So if, let me ask you this, Dr. Kim, we talked about how you differentiate some of the arthritis versus, you know, if it's, if it feels better after, uh, feels worse after rest, and you mentioned we were talking about gout and some other things earlier. So if a patient presented with um, an arthritis that seemed to be worse like in the morning or after significant rest and, and this kind of severe stiffness, also with some what we call class as patients kind of classic autoimmune or autoinflammatory features like fatigue, for example, um, is that something that, um, at least for, let's say, primary care physicians, to get them to refer quicker, would you think that, 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 that pairing some of those classic signs with the type of arthritis, if we could somehow educate the primary care physicians or hospitals or nurses, if we could get that that could possibly uh, trigger an earlier referral process? Because that's really what we want to figure out, is how can we get people to the rheumatologist quicker and then how can we help the rheumatologist uh from there you know di diagnose quicker 
Yeah. So I think this is something you know Tiffany and I have discussed before is that uh, the most common debilitating symptoms experienced by autoimmune patients are actually the least helpful from a diagnostic perspective. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And fatigue, for example. Right. I never once have brought up fatigue. Have you noticed that? Right. Yes. Because it's not helpful from a diagnostic perspective. If fatigue is just far too common in the U.S. population as a whole. Mm-hmm. Right. That it's, it's it's just again, it tells me that you're still alive for all intents and purposes. So this is the reason why, like, at least with joint pain, you know, we kind of we delve into that aspect. But again, this then does not validate the impact of disease on a patient. Right. Right. Because the fatigue could be the most debilitating aspect that is ruining their quality of life because they can't do anything. If they have kids at home, they can't help them with their homework or even help them get a meal together because their fatigue is so debilitating. And, but, you know, for us, we want to understand where the fatigue is coming from. If it's associated with autoimmune disease, then we focus on autoimmune disease symptoms that end up being specific to help us towards that. We Mm -hmm. want to help the fatigue if it's helpable. Oftentimes, a lot of people have chronic insomnia. They've forgotten how to sleep. That requires a great deal of cognitive behavioral therapy in order to overcome that, that we don't have expertise. And a lot of sleep people actually don't have expertise in either. But having putting that aside, you know, the symptoms that end up being really helpful sometimes play a minor role in a patient's overall um, quality of life, right? And this is the discord, I think, that we run into uh, when we have patient counters where sometimes the patient is talking about their fatigue about five or 10 minutes. And the entire time I'm thinking, you know, this is really debilitating, but I, I'm, nowhere clo- I'm nowhere closer to figuring out what this person has, mm-hmm. right? All I know is that this is an a priori quality of life issue for the patient. And they've given me the, you know, the, uh, the 10th example of how this impacts them in a major, major way, right? So sometimes, you know, I have to cut people off a little bit to be able to pivot to other symptoms that they may not find important, but we find important, right? I think that's the biggest challenge with rheumatic diseases, the diagnosis. Again, not having blood work or or, or, uh, radiographic findings that are very specific and durable, right, for a diagnosis is that, you know, how do we make sure that we uh, accommodate that quality of life issue but also then really focus on the th- piece of information that then becomes actionable as a therapeutic, right? That's, that's a real discord that I, I, I still struggle with, mm-hmm. you know, so from a, uh, so that, you know, from a prime care physician perspective in terms of early diagnosis, it ends up that the discussion sometimes feels random to a patient. I would bet same thing with me when they first see me, I'm asking questions that are like, yeah, my, my knuckles hurt in the morning, but you know, whatever. I mean, the main problem is I, I'm really fatigued, mm-hmm. right? So that's where the discord and the, you know, comes into play. Um, so, uh, you know, so I, you know, part of the issue is even if we had this algorithm that we had proposed earlier, right? Will the patients even buy into it, right? Because their primary quality of life issues are not addressed. Would, would well, patients buy that, into it? I think we would buy into it if we helped create it. Yep. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. right. And and we said, okay, but the, you know, this, one of the things that really struck me is interesting, Dr. Kim, is you were talking about the fatigue and, you know, as an autoimmune patient or autoinflammatory patient, we will, all, as you said, I mean, typically the number one across the board, doesn't matter what your diagnosis is. That is just extremely ish, a big issue in quality of life. And thinking about it, trying to say, okay, well, what are these autoimmune features? It's if, an, if a primary care physician could identify fatigue and this kind of joint pain and you know a couple other things that are, are classic with an autoimmune disease or an autoinflammatory disease, that equals referral to rheumatologists, but as you said, so many people do complain about fatigue for different reasons. And so that takes me back to what Sue said about those other innuendos that we talk about as a community. When you were saying that, Sue, I thought about how so many people will say, I thought that my bed just got uncomfortable. Right. (laughs) Because I did that too. I thought I needed a new bed. 
And and so yep. those are the kind of things that uh, that you hear it all the time. But if there was some way that we could combine, um, and and the purpose of these these shows um, are that we come to the table, we talk about the issues, and we start to think about different solutions, and then we bring them back to you know the community, or we talk about them offline and try to come up with with a solution. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good start. I definitely I love that. This is no, a I love that. Well. Thank you. That's our whole mission <laughs> as wait, an organization. Wait, so wait, wait. There's a purpose. Oh, you have an organization. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here? Wait, what? <laughs> what, what where am I? I'm ready to get ran over by this big car behind me. But <laughs> yeah. uh. um, so I did want to delve in before. I know we're 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 kind of pressed for time here, but but um, Suze, I wanted you to. You've done a lot of work in this in this field and while one of the things also at our organization um, that we do is we do not duplicate efforts um, we try to learn what others are doing and then build off of them or collaborate that that kind of thing so just like any any good project you need to do your due diligence and understand what what's been done so Suze, will you share some of the the work that you've done on this topic yeah thank you so much for the question um my, I think, I can't remember now if I said this in the beginning, time has lost all meaning in this pandemic. Um, but I, I think I said this a little bit ago. Um, my, my sort of biggest passion is, is clinical education, clinical training. So the two programs I've been in for a long time, the first thing I did as a patient advocate was um, served as a, a patient faculty member at a medical school in Kansas City. Um, it was there was a whole squad of us. Everyone either had RA or JA. We went through a really intense training program. It took about three months. Um, I happened to be pre med, so that was helpful because we learned all of the anatomy, um, physiology for every joint, um, and we would instruct students in pods of four, there would be one patient instructor and four students, and we would actually teach them how to do a musculoskeletal exam using our bodies as sort of living textbooks. So they could feel swelling. Um, they would understand what it looked like to palpate someone and cause pain. Um, I will say every year without fail, at least one of the students passed out. Um, so we had to get very good at like if you see someone start to wobble, we'd have to, you know, tell them to sit down. I've never quite known whether that was maybe the realization that as part of their job, they're going to have to hurt people. I didn't know if that was it or if it was just the gravity of, of working with patients because we were very often their first real patient experience. There was not an attending clinician in the room. It was just us. Um, that program, I think, in a lot of ways was valuable. It not only taught the anatomy physiology component, it really talked to, it focused a lot on having those students sort of walk a mile in our shoes. So we would do inspection, palpation, range of motion. And then when we got to function, we would ask them, okay, so I've shown you all of the joint damage in my hands. What functions do you think I would have trouble doing? And it would, engender this dialogue and you would just see these light bulbs going off like oh my gosh it didn't even occur if 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 my hands were like that i wouldn't be able to shave my beard or um, tie my shoes so so that was a great program it's still going on um, but not in a streamlined way it's kind of here or there depending on whether um, the schools can get funding i'd really like to see that program come back to life it's something i'm sort of always working on making happen the other program I've been doing for about 10 years is a CME. Um, it's always a, a rheumatologist, a primary care clinician, and me, or another patient faculty person um, that I recruit. And it's about just really hammering home that as the primary care clinician, you are the gatekeeper for our well being. Um, if you miss a diagnosis and that person lingers, all of that joint damage. Um, could have been prevented. We, we actually have therapies that work now. So it's, it's bringing that firsthand story to life in the, in the body of the CME. Um, and then I guess I should say, also, I mentioned I, I do work for 
SIDM, the Society to Improve Diagnosis and Medicine, and they're just doing kind of on every conceivable front, trying to improve diagnosis, tackling a lot of the things, Dr. Kim, that you've mentioned, sort of the the risk of anchoring, like once you've locked down on a diagnosis and that's what the diagnosis is, no matter what, how do we fix that? What's the cognitive reasoning we can teach? Um, so there's just a lot of, so I encourage everyone to look at that website, um, sidm.org, uh, that a lot of diagnostic work going on. And if you've got tales of your own diagnostic errors, diagnostic journeys, we collect patient stories at SIDM, so please check it out. Um, so that's a, that's a little bit, and those are the, the things I'm really passionate about. And we've actually, I should say, studied the CME and looked at claims data for learners versus age matched. Uh, I don't know how else they match the control arm, but they've, they've looked at it. And the rates of referral are up, I think, 11% among learners versus non-learners. Um, so we do think there's some positive trend there. So, um, yeah, that, that's what that's I've been also doing. That's deserved. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, it's exciting. Thanks, Tiffany. <laughs> that, that, that's great. Well, um, as we need to start wrapping down here, um, again, if you're just joining us, the purpose of our, our talk show is we ingrain it into our mission. Our mission literally, ha we have six steps to our process. We are people living with these diseases ourselves. And then we have also co-hosts like Suze. She's not affiliated with our organization. She is a, a fellow person living with the diseases who is passionate about, um, about talking about this and helping other people. So she, like a dozen plus other co-hosts that we have all around the world from Australia, we have um, Pooja from Mumbai, India, we have Simon from um, in Europe, and we have a lot of different co-hosts to bring different perspectives um, to the table. And once we identify as people living with these diseases, what some of these, these issues are, because there are learned experiences, there are lived experiences, then we bring the topic to the table, and that's kind of step number two. So we bring something to the table, and then we start to introduce it, which we had done in a previous podcast, a couple of them. So we will link to those podcasts. So you can hear some of these earlier discussions about the need to differentiate arthritis types. This branched out to really focusing on how can we um, obtain earlier detection to referrals to diagnosis and how can we work together with rheumatologists to figure out um, how we can start to develop some resources to make that happen. And so that was sort of the, the conversation here today that we need to continue. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the, a late, the later step. Um, and I, I guess I'll call that step five. So the first step would have been the first podcast when we laid the issue on the table. Then we go back to all of you and we hear more input, analyze it, and then come back. So this was coming back to the table with more input. And then we're getting other stakeholders to join us so that we people living with the diseases as equals start to solve the problems together. Um, if we had the solutions today, we would jump to, say, to step six, the final, and we'd put the resource out, our problem solved. But we need to jump back and go back to, to phase three, four, five again, and we keep doing that little circle, um, talking to all of you and getting your input until the solution um, is, is, has been had. But I think we did a good job of, of kind of, of laying, laying some things out. Um, one of the the things that I would like to really point out, and I know it's really important to you, Deb, and you both don't know what this is because you weren't probably on the earlier one, <laughs> but this is a symbol. I have all kinds of them. I have like helmets and stuff, um, but this is a symbol. So for those of you who are listening to all of our tracks, this is track one, differentiating arthritis. Um, if you see this symbol, then it means it's a learning lesson, a takeaway. And um, I would like to, uh, to make sure that, I'm, that there is a takeaway that, um, first of all, there are different types of arthritis. <laughs> so um, there are, it is not just one type. Uh, there, the type that is associated with autoimmune or autoinflammatory uh, diseases, typically you're going to have the severe stiffness after rest. Um, there could be some other inflammatory um, factors. Dr. Kim, would you like to add to the differentiation while we've got the while we've got the sign up? <laughs> That's why if people are scrolling through, they're like, "Oh, stop!" <laughs> <laughs> I 
like that? <laughs> <laughs> that was very, very clever. Um, I think for, I think for patients, um, awareness of their symptoms, where it's occurring, how is it manifesting, and of course, how it's impacting them, and trying to figure out how they could, you know, maybe separate some of those. That's hard. It requires a lot of discussion and potentially education with the healthcare provider. But that's mm -hmm. something to maybe mandate the next visit if this conversation hasn't happened. It's just to say, listen, I, you know, a lot of, I know other RA patients that are like a one out of 10 or zero out of 10. I feel like I'm at a four. I'm just trying to figure out, is there something else I can do to kind of better hone in into my body and figure out what else could be going on that can help you as the healthcare mm -hmm. provider? Okay. Suze, what would you like to add as a takeaway for, for people to really understand the differences? And it's not, you know, the arthritis and associated, you know, the disease, our disease as a whole, and because that's the whole idea of the auto, right? The whole body, the auto body. So um, right. what would you like? I have a feeling I know, but I'm going to. Um, what's my guidance for patients navigating themselves or for patients just being involved in the cause just get or, being involved what, being what would involved. you say that people should know like what is the thing that everyone should should really realize when they're going through through getting this diagnostic journey with these diseases that you I bet this is exactly what you think I'm going to say I, I should think, wrote <laughs> I, I should write it down <laughs> so we can see test if I'm right I would say trust your gut and be your own advocate. And if you really feel like something is wrong and you're not being heard, um, then you need to keep pursuing. And you can reach out. I mean, if you if you know about all of us, Tiffany, me, others in this community, you can reach out to us. We're happy to help you. Um, but just know that you know your own body. And so you really have to be your advocate um, I've experienced a pretty significant medical error, um, and it still blows me away that I sort of allowed it to happen to myself because I consider myself a patient advocate. You have to you have to trust that sort of that thing in your gut that's telling you ah something's something's wrong and I need an answer. So just I was wrong. Feel... <laughs> I said blood work. <laughs> oh oh well that oh, that is my issue. Ah. Uh, it does not have to be positive. I'm just going to get t-shirts made. I, that's, I mean. It doesn't have to be positive right there. This, that's a good takeaway. That's a good takeaway. Right uh, there. Um, so, so we, so um, if you have been submitting comments throughout, throughout this, um, we, we have seen them and we are collecting them. Uh, we needed to, we were getting through this um, episode with, with really specific on differentiating arthritis type. So I did see some questions coming in um, about stills disease. So shout out to those with stills. Um, and I think that would be a great um, episode uh, to have back. I know um, Dr. Um, Concias is somebody that we're working with. No offense, Dr. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> we are working with um, oh, on our stills. How dare you? Brochures. And um, and actually, we're going to do a breakout episode all on those stills disease brochures with um, with one of our volunteers who has a uh, stills disease. So uh, we will be doing that actually tomorrow afternoon. So if you want the full schedule of everything that we will be doing over this auto ball, which is again, the online gala for the International Foundation for Autoimmune Autoinflammatory Arthritis, because we were booted out of the, the, the physical event because of COVID-19, but now we are online and we'll be here through the 20th, which is World Autoimmune and Autoinflammatory Arthritis Day, which is the very first program we ever we ever established as an organization. So that's why we're leading up to that. I would like to ask um, Suze and Dr. Kim both, uh, if you could tell everybody where they could find you. Let's start with Suze. Yeah, so you can find me. Um, uh, first of all, my, uh, my patient engagement initiative, Expect, that I mentioned earlier, is we have a website at expect.net, N-E-T, um, I am on Twitter at Shrant Suz, S-C-H-R-A-N-D-T-S-U-Z. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, 
that's uh, I'm everywhere <laughs> and I'm on Facebook. <laughs> I'm, every, I'm everywhere. <laughs> uh, you can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, um, and Dr. Kim, where can people find you? So through social media, I'm very active on Twitter. That's Al H Kim, A L H K I M as in Mary. Um, if you're in the central time zone area, relatively close to St. Louis, uh, you know, we would love to see you. Um, I predominantly look at lupus, but we have other providers looking at other diseases. The number to reach us at is 314-286-2635. Um, and so you can leave a number and ask um, you know, for follow-up to determine whether or not you need a referral, et cetera, et cetera, but we can get you in. Great. Thank you for that. And then again, thank you for continuing your comments. Um, sharing your stories is very important here at our organization. So um, if you would like to continue that conversation, we are putting a, a link on aiarthritis.org backslash autoball, and you'll be able to submit any stories, any comments or questions that you may not have asked on, on the comment section of these live shows. Uh, and or if you wanted to do it privately, you can submit there. We are collecting all of them. Your voices matter. Um, so we will make sure that we continue the conversation and consider your questions and, and try to get answers uh, to you on those. Um, also, I would just like to give a shout out the, the background here. This is the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> I have the backdrop. This is where the auto ball was supposed to take place. And uh, so I do have a few different backdrops that, that I will be, but I told them that I would be doing um, a shout out to them because they have been absolutely wonderful in help in, in postponing our auto ball because of COVID. And we are going to be doing it now in St. Louis, May 1st of 2021. So Dr. Kim, put that on your calendar. <laughs> Done. Um, so, so we want to make sure also uh, that this, this whole um, event, please register. So we will put a link to register to get the schedule of all of the, the segments that we are doing here on, uh, on the show. Uh, we also are asking, please share this, uh, this Facebook page with anyone that you think might be interested in these. The whole purpose of the auto ball is to honor all of you who are living with these diseases. And so you can learn and others can learn about what we do so that we can help even more. Um, there's also on the auto ball page, there is a link to donate. We would certainly love your, your support. Um, and I'm also going to do a little follow-up with uh, Dr. Kim on Roomy Round. So uh, we'll, we'll do that here in a minute. But in closing, Dr. Kim, you're also going to get one of these fine, fine trophies um, oh. sent to your. <laughs> Dr. Kim was supposed to be at the actual auto ball where we were going to give him an award uh, for for real, for collaborating with us him and the whole the whole group at Wash U, uh, Washington University Rheumatology has just been really supportive and helping us develop this show and the breakout roomy round. So we wanted to, to give a big, a big shout out and thank you. So, you know, there, there, there Our I, pleasure. I, I will accept this award on your behalf. <laughs> I'm going to find you and take it, <laughs> but I, I will be, I will be follow up with you about um, where, where to send that. So that is all that we have. You can find all of our podcast episodes, which we actually have over 50 now. Um, at aiarthritis.org backslash podcast. You can also subscribe uh, anywhere that you listen to podcasts at AI Arthritis Voices 360. And please give us a rating and tell us um, your, how you feel about us. We would be, I hope, be happy <laughs> about that. And uh, that's it for the lives today. I, we're going to be signing off because patients need rest and I am going to be your your main host for the rest of the week and I need I need to not flare so <laughs> thank you Dr. Kim thank you Suze uh, for for participating in this and thank all of you uh, for joining just know that your voices matter and your voice at this table matters so please make sure that you always pull up a seat and join us at the table thank you all thank you